Chapter 15, May 6, 1863 A few weeks after the Louisville episode, the regiment was transferred again, this time to Vicksburg, in the army of General Grant. Vicksburg, on the east bank of the Mississippi River, was a Confederate rail center. If the Union could capture it, the southern forces would be almost cut in two. But the city was well defended, guarded by river and swamplands on one side and steep craggy bluffs on the other. The rebels' main defense was a system of trenches stretching for miles from Haines Bluff to the Warrington Road. Since Grant's men far outnumbered the defenders, he tried to storm these trenches directly, but the rebels under General John Pemberton, fighting skillfully, beat off every attack and left the Union with thousands of casualties. Finally, Grant was forced to dig in, and a long siege began. Vicksburg was sealed off on the riverside by Union warships. On the land side, Union artillery bombarded it with endless shells. Little by little, a noose of steel tightened around the besieged city. Later, a Confederate soldier wrote home that even a cat couldn't have crept out of Vicksburg without being discovered. All this caused great suffering on both sides. The cannoning killed hundreds of soldiers and civilians inside the wrecked and starving city. Meanwhile, rebel sharpshooters hidden on the bluffs picked off great numbers of Union men. At times, the Federal troops had to crouch in trenches up to their knees in water, unable to raise their heads because of the hail of sniper bullets. During these nightmarish weeks, Private Thompson and the nurses worked without rest. The surgeons were completely exhausted, and Mrs. Butler, along with the other officers' wives, came to the hospital daily to help tend the wounded. Then Emma's luck, which up till then had been so good, suddenly ran out. For some time she'd been feeling sick, but had been too busy to do anything about it. Her symptoms became worse, and at last she had to face the truth. She was suffering from malaria, or swamp fever, as the soldiers called it. Dr. Hodes and his assistants dosed Private Thompson with quinine, but it did no good. The malaria was severe. One minute he burned with fever, the next he shook with a terrible chill. He could hardly sleep or eat and found himself getting weaker by the day. Finally, Thompson applied for leave but gave no details and his request was turned down. In this crisis, headquarters needed every single skilled nurse and that was that. Desperate, Emma turned to her trusted friend. What should I do? She wailed, sitting in Mrs. Butler's tent, shivering in an army blanket. I can't just climb into a bed in the hospital. If I take my clothes off, they'll know my secret. I'll be finished. Mrs. Butler paced the little tent unhappily. I don't know what to say, my dear. You're very sick. You have to be hospitalized. Sakes, I'd nurse you here if I could, but there's no room. Besides, the Major would learn the truth. He'd feel it's his duty to report you to headquarters. In tears, the women embraced each other. Then Emma trudged back to the hospital, feeling hopeless. She was ill and confused. Her world was splintering. Her imp voice was silent. For two years she'd posed as a man and had played the part well. To give it all up now, to be glaringly exposed, was a painful humiliation. Somehow, to Emma's fevered mind, it would shame her and make a joke of everything she'd tried to do. She remembered feeling the same kind of deep hopelessness when she was sixteen. Then she'd solve the problem by running away. Now again, flight seemed the best way out. The only way out. Yes, she would leave quietly, get the help she needed, and come back to Vicksburg when she was stronger. For Emma, to decide on something was to act on it. She left a brief note for Mrs. Butler explaining her plans and asking her to please look after Rebel. Then she packed her kit, took the money she'd saved, and slipped out of the nurse's quarters. Before dawn, she hitched a ride out of camp on a drover's cart. Later, near Steele's Bayou, she took passage on the Mississippi River boat and headed north to Cairo, Illinois. Cairo was a bustling town, big enough to boast a hospital. Emma, weak and shaky, managed to buy a skirt, blouse, and bonnet. In a rented room, she changed from a Union soldier back to plain Miss Edmonds. Then she went to the hospital and signed herself in for treatment. Emma remained in bed for several weeks and with the proper food, rest, and medical care, gradually recovered. She followed the war news eagerly and learned that Vicksburg had surrendered. At the same time, an army under General George Meade defeated Lee's forces in the Battle of Gettysburg. These two events helped the Union turn a corner. Victory was still a distant dream, 
but the beginning but the but was beginning to come closer emma sensed the turn of the tide and with her malaria under control planned to rejoin her old outfit instead she received another blow scanning the army bulletins in the window of the cairo newspaper office she saw that private franklin thompson of the second michigan was listed as AWOL, absent without leave. In the Army's books, she had been branded a deserter. For Emma Edmonds, a door suddenly slammed shut. Now there was no way she could take up her old work as a field nurse, courier, and union spy. Private Thompson was considered a deserter. He couldn't protest without an investigation in which the secret would surely come out. For a time, Emma was heartsick. Then she reacted to the setback the way she always did, with action. Frank Thompson might be finished, but the war was still on, and there were many ways she could be useful. She sent word to Mrs. Butler, telling her what had happened, then with the last of her funds, bought a train ticket to Washington. After her two years away, she found the capital more hectic and chaotic than ever. Wounded men were pouring in, and here, far from the fighting fronts, good nurses were badly needed. She found a place to live and went quickly to work in one of the base hospitals. For the remainder of the war, Emma served as a nurse under her rightful name, tending and comforting the wounded. Now and then she would run into a trooper from Vicksburg or Yorktown and would ply him with questions about friends and acquaintances. She also followed in detail the battles of those final years. Chickamauga, Missionary Ridge, Spotsylvania, the Wilderness, Atlanta, Petersburg. Emma exulted in each Union victory and wept for the dead and dying of both sides. Early in April of 1865, government troops finally occupied the battered rebel capital of Richmond. On the ninth of that same month, General Lee surrendered the Confederate armies to Ulysses Grant, and at last, the long ordeal was over. Two days later, Abraham Lincoln made a speech from a window of the White House. The president, gaunt and weary, spoke of peace and honor, of charity and the healing of wounds. Among those in the huge crowd who cheered themselves hoarse was Emma Edmonds. The Sunday after the South surrender happened to be Easter, and Emma went to church. One of the songs that morning was an Easter hymn she'd always loved. As she sang with the others, she realized it could have been written for that very time in history. The strife is o'er, the battle done, the victory of life is won. Our song of triumph has begun. Alleluia. Looking back at the years of war, she thought of all the people she'd known and the roles she played. When she first enlisted in Michigan, it was a kind of lark. She'd had little idea what lay ahead, but she'd met all the challenges and done her best. Emma's heart was full. Her beloved land was finally at peace. Now it was time for the healing. <laughs>